Hello, Frank. Good morning. Are you online with us? Yes, I am. I'm online with you. How are you doing? Hello, Frank. Lovely to hear you. It sounds like you're just next door, not on the other side of the ocean. Lovely to hear from you. Yes, um, I, 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 um, I actually am next door. I'm next door to everybody right now. If you look out your window, you'll see me. Frank, we've come up to 14.45 on this side of the world. Do you mind if I steal one minute just to very briefly introduce? Or is that cutting Go ahead. Time? That's great. Okay. Super. Well, hello, everybody. And just to say that really delighted that for the next couple of marketplace sessions, we've got the logistics emergency teams with us. I think the first session from the logistics emergency team is on the successful public private partnership that is represented by the LET. And then we're going to move on to a session called Eduardo. I won't steal the mystery from that by going into the details, but another fantastic initiative from the LET partners contributing to the whole humanitarian logistics community and I just wanted to say how really delighted we are and how blessed we are to have had the support of the LET not just over so many years but last year was particularly intense of course and just to say how um, how grateful we are for their fantastic responsiveness to all the many and varied requests that we, we, we pass across the LET for support on behalf of the whole partnership. So, um, Frank, big thanks to you and the LET for that. It's really greatly appreciated. Um, and I think particularly interesting as well as we go into Eduardo to see the amazing power of data and how that public-private um, partnership um, is really um, key to the maximization of the use of data and how um, integral that is to increasing the, the efficiency and effectiveness of the humanitarian response. So, Frank, huge thanks, and I don't want to steal any more of your, your, your time, but thank you very much, and over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks for giving us an opportunity to talk with the cluster today. Uh, it's great to see, all some, see some uh, familiar names on the call. Um, with us participating in the call today is my uh, colleague from UPS, Alice Turner. Um, my colleagues from Agility, Maria Samantwala. She is one of our senior team members in our uh, India and South Asia organization and runs our, uh, our ocean product, am among uh, a few other things. You'll hear some more from her uh, later today. She's an expert in the field and has been uh, doing supply chain uh, for, for, uh, for many years. Um, also, uh, uh, Alan Silito is going to be joining us. He's from our, our UK, uh, sorry, from our Canada operations. Uh, both Alan and Maria have participated in uh, the Eduardo project, and you'll learn a lot more from that later. And uh, uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention my uh, colleague David Wu from uh, from UPS, who is uh, legitimately everyone get ready, get ready, get, hold on to your socks because you're going to talk to a real data scientist today. This is uh, this is uh, my colleague David. Uh, so. Um, let me uh, see if I can get my computer to, to work and I will share my screen and we'll do our, our presentation. Hopefully it won't uh, be, uh, it, uh, it won't uh, put you out at the end of the, at the, end of the week. Um, okay, uh, so can everyone, I uh, hope everyone, Alice, can you see the screen okay? Okay, good, all right. Uh, so we're gonna do a couple things in this presentation. Uh, we'll talk about the LET as, a, as an overview. We'll give you uh, an update about what we've been up to and how much we've been bothering uh, Athley and Bruno. And uh, then we'll uh, have a, a, a session about um, the, uh, the Eduardo uh, uh, utility that we've been working on. Um, so uh, LET at a glance. Um, the LET is a partnership for those of you, uh, of, of the people in the, in the call today who aren't familiar with us. Uh, we're a partnership of four of the biggest global logistics companies, DP World, UPS, Maersk, and Agility. Um, we, we are facilitated by the World Economic Forum, which gives us a neutral platform in which we can engage with each other and talk about issues without uh, having antitrust uh, problems and everything related to that. Um, we support the logistics cluster, which is, of course, led by the UN World Food Program. And our goal is to unite the capacity and resources of the industry to bring them to bear, uh, to support humanitarians, to improve the efficacy of humanitarian response, but also uh, to, to lend a hand when, uh, when sudden onset emergencies or protracted emergencies are ongoing, or even in, in uh, preparedness and planning operations. So that's kind of the scope of the partnership. Um, for our operation support program, uh, we, support, we provide support to humanitarian organizations via the cluster. So all of our requests come to, uh, for support come to us by the cluster or we'll proactively uh, approach the cluster and say, hey, we might be able to do things during a sudden onset emergency or during a, so during a humanitarian crisis. 
So some of the things that we can do are deployment of logistics experts. We can provide warehousing, customs clearance services, uh, airlift, uh, ocean freight, and road transport. Um, we found over the years, this program has been uh, in existence since about 2006. So believe it or not, we're in year 15. Um, it's pretty amazing. It's been a great journey. Um, we found that our deployment and engagement of our people tend to be very, very uh, valuable and important. We get good results from that. Um, our team members uh, like Maria and Alan and David uh, have a significant amount of information about uh, the industry, about local processes, about regional processes, uh, the best way to move cargo, the best way to clear it and things of that nature. So that information uh, resource that and expertise that our, uh, our deployed personnel offer is very, very good. Um, we tend to deploy only people who have been in the industry for 10 years or more, or we assign people in, 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 uh, to those projects. Um, uh, so they, they can actually bring in and add value. Uh, customs clearance is another example of this. Uh, many years ago, we had a, a very, very uh, good experience with a guy named Oliver Bartolo, who was a UPS employee. And he ran the, the one-stop shop effectively um, for customs in the, in the during the Taklobot emergency, like I think six or seven years ago. But it was very, very good. He, he integrated well with the, with the cluster. They gave him a mobile phone and everyone would just you know, beat up uh, 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 Oliver with, uh, with phone calls about customs clearance. Um, the support includes uh, pro bono assets and services and the uh, deployment of people who are, uh, are qualified to support. Um, we also, uh, before we allow anyone to deploy or engage, we put them through a training program and we work in concert with the cluster on the training program to make sure that our team members understand the humanitarian context, uh, the ethical parameters of, of how humanitarians are operating. Um, it's different from commercial. Um, so we, we give them all, all kinds of training to help them understand what the, the logistics and supply chain problem is, as well as uh, the context in which they will be working. <clears throat> For preparedness and resilience support, we do a few different things with the cluster. We do uh, logistics capacity assessments. We, we, we generally have a, a list of countries on which we're contributing to LCAs during the year. And sometimes that very frequently that list will change. It'll be a prioritization based on an emergent need for humanitarians. So we'll uh, step up and offer support if we can do that. Um, we also do training. Uh, we participate with the, with the cluster for training for the LET employees. And then we also will participate and be, uh, you know, during the, the, um, the training that the LRT training that the cluster has periodically throughout the year, we'll, we'll phone in or participate in that training as well. Um, and then we also do some work with the preparedness platform and log.ie. We haven't really de de jumped in since it's rebranded. But we did work with, uh, with the preparedness uh, platform and the preparedness program. Um, and we participated in a few sessions uh, in Indonesia and Bangladesh um, and some other locations wherein you know, we helped. There's one aspect of, of the preparedness program, which is around network building. And all of our companies have very good uh, contacts and networks in a lot of these countries where uh, the preparedness work is ongoing. So we, we've, we've been contributing to that as well. Um, the program overview from 2021. Uh, this is a, the, our 15th year of our, of our partnership. Um, we've supported uh, uh, emergency response uh, operations or humanitarian operations all around the world. This, this map here, it's kind of a dim image, um, but it's part of our, uh, our annual report from last year. And it just gives like the highlights of projects in which we've participated, but we've done a lot more than that. We've, we've done a lot of work in LCAs around the world. And then there are some, um, you know, other types of emergencies or things that we, uh, that we, that were not uh, listed on this one, but we do, we, we've been engaged with the cluster for, for many years. Um, we've tried to focus, uh, our original mandate was on sudden onset natural disasters, uh, but that was 15 years ago. And in that ensuing time period, there's been a lot of change where there's been a much bigger requirement for humanitarian support in complex emergencies um, and protracted uh, engagements. So we've started to engage more with those. We changed the rules of our, of our rules of engagement and our memoranda of understanding, um, had some impact on our training and other things like that. We don't, you know, we, we always focus, if we're gonna do a deployment or provide services, we always focus on, you know, is the, can each one of our companies do this? You know, no one's obligated to do it. If they have the capability and capacity to do so, they can. 
but very frequently the emergencies which humanitarians are responding to are the same emergencies our own operations are managing uh, in, in their day-to-day -day work. So we always reach out and ask if, if the local offices can support. If they can't, then we leave them alone. And if they can, then we contextualize it and see what we can do in terms of making sure the health, safety, and security, the welfare of the staffers are, are taken care of. And then if we can, then we, we proceed to support. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting program. It's been in existence for 15 years. It's a, it's a highlight. We really, really like it. We've got a great partnership. We've developed a lot of great friends amongst the four different companies, as well as the cluster over the many years that we've uh, been engaging with each other. Um, for 2020 COVID response, as you guys know, most of the, most of the challenges that, that we faced have been related to a very, very disrupted uh, market and uh, lack of understanding about what's available out there in terms of capacity, what is in the pipeline, uh, how, are, how can things move, and um, you know, what, what can be imported, what can be exported. There was, you know, it, this was a huge disruption in the supply chain and it had a cascading effect on the rest of the humanitarian system. So, you know, COVID turned the air freight uh, uh, market on its head. It's turning the, the ocean freight market on its head now. Um, so what we started to do with the cluster early on, all, first of all, all the companies were engaging bilaterally with different initiatives. So the pandemic supply chain network and other, uh, you know, other, other uh, initiatives like that. But with the cluster, we started focusing on providing them um, capacities and constraints information, especially for items on the DCP, the disease commodity package uh, from WHO, um, including PPE. Um, we also, uh, we did a lot of work on origin and destination capacity constraints. And we tried to do some work on import and export restrictions because some markets were not exporting materials. Some markets were, you know, requiring different standards and things for importing. Um, and then we were looking at uh, airports and ports uh, capacities and, and, and ability to serve uh, uh, cargo and, uh, that's moving. Um, we also uh, worked with the cluster to do cargo handling safety protocols and information sharing. There was a lot of uncertainty about what the impact of COVID might be on things like packages and refrigerated cargo and stuff like that. So we did some work with our safety team members and contributed that to the, to the cluster and the, the, WA, the, the, uh, the WHO and WFP. Um, we did a global COVID response risk mapping to, to go through and find out, okay, what, what are some of the risks if, if uh, you know, if one, if COVID has a, has a big outbreak in any particular geography, what are some of the risks that need to be, in, be baked into supply chain planning? And again, we did a lot of work with the pandemic supply chain network. And then all LET companies signed the, the, the World Economic Forum supply chain and transport industry um, commitment to equitable distribution of COVAX. Um, so we're, all of our companies have been engaged in the COVID response uh, throughout the year. To varying degrees, but a lot of it, again, if you look at this, it's a lot of it is about information, about getting information to humanitarians so they can make decisions with it and they can do their planning. That's a very uh, interesting approach. Uh, our COVID response, um, more pragmatically, we did a humanitarian hub feasibility study for for the China area to see, okay, what would it what what would a what would it take to set up a, a hub in China? Would it work? Would it be beneficial to the humanitarian system or not? moved some high energy biscuits from Dubai uh, to the Central African Republic, um, donated uh, reefer containers to COVID support and vaccine rollout in South Sudan, and then offered free warehouse space in Ghana, Dubai, and Malaysia. These are the things that we did via the cluster, but each one of our companies also did stuff with other humanitarian partners along the way. I know UPS, Immersed and DP World did a lot in terms of donating resources to some of the cluster members that are actually engaging COVID response, but also making assets available for the impact that COVID had on the rest of the humanitarian system. Um, and uh, the, I'm sure Alice can tell us more about that uh, uh, later if people have questions. Um, for preparedness and resilience last year, we did uh, warehouse capacity assessments in Guangzhou, China. Again, that was kind of related to this idea of like, okay, how do we improve the efficiency of exporting uh, PPE and other materials out of China to support the humanitarian system? Did seaport capacities in Liege, um, warehouse and seaport, seaport capacities in Johannesburg, uh, and Accra, Dubai, and Kuala Lumpur warehouse and uh, ports and transportation capacity assessments there. 
Um, all of this was just to update the, the, the information that the cluster has at its fingertips to make information available to the humanitarian community about how to, uh, how to best um, move cargo in those geographies and support. Uh, because if you notice, these are, a lot of these are where the, um, uh, this, is, this is a lot related to uh, human, UNHRDs as well as the, the COVID response. So Johannesburg, you know, that became a center of, uh, of uh, deployment of COVID material into Africa. Uh, the other thing we did uh, for humanitarian operations in 2020 was the Lebanon response after that horrific uh, explosion in Lebanon last summer. We provided information to the cluster. The cluster had a very good uh, operation already running in that area, so they didn't really need to need too much. But information we we found we thought think that was helpful. We didn't really require um, you know we, all of our companies offered to donate some sorts of services. But it really wasn't necessary. The, the Lebanese community really, really responded. Uh, the Lebanese businesses, uh, NGOs, and other organizations and peoples, you know, they, they, they really kicked in and, and, and gave a lot of resources to uh, people in need. Um, so while we offered stuff, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. Um, and then UPS and Agility connected on, on our on the ground contacts to the logs cluster to uh, help them sort logistic, you know, capacities and information availability. And then we also, here's our first teaser, we, we, we also had a really cool project uh, development we call Eduardo, and uh, you'll hear about that pretty soon. I'm not going to give you any, any surprises, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, our LET program for 2021, our primary requirement remains disaster uh, response. Um, we're also going to continue with LE, LCAs and preparedness, log updates, uh, LRT training, and similar things. Our these are items that are on our agenda, on our program agenda on an ongoing basis. And then we'll engage with cluster on projects related to environment, uh, customs. Uh, we may work with the cluster for uh, cluster meetings, global cluster meetings and things of that nature. Um, and then strategic partners engagement. So if the cluster, you know, we, they want you know, us to engage with other private sector organizations, we will do that uh, as well. But our, our program priorities for the, the for 2021 are listed there. There's, we've got about 12 different things that we're looking at and that we'll continue to work on with the cluster throughout the year. Um, some of it's kind of cool and, ex and exciting. Eduardo, see there's Eduardo again. Everybody loves Eduardo. Um, 2021 LCAs. Uh, this is what we have in the pipeline for contribution to LCAs this year. This is the, the, the countries that the cluster has requested uh, that we support. Uh, all the, a lot of the people on the call will look at these and say, yes, I understand why we need that. Uh, so hopefully the, the uh, LET will be able to contribute to some of these LCAs uh, throughout the rest of the year. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, it for um, uh, the LET update. Uh, so uh, Athlete, uh, uh, any, uh, Jessica, do you want to take any questions about the LET or anything like that before we jump into uh, the next session? That'd be super, Frank. If anybody's got any questions and answers, that'd be great if you've got a few minutes still to take those. It looks like a busy year, 2021, Frank. Well, yeah, it's busy for, you know, we always tell people that uh, we're a small tool in a very big toolbox, and there's a lot of other tools in there as well. So, you know, we've got stuff going on, but everyone else in the call has probably a lot more going on than we do. So. Alice, uh, any uh, any comments you'd like to add uh, to the LET update? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, I mean, I think you did a really great job covering it. Um, we enjoy supporting the logistics cluster. And um, I mean, no, we had okay. a good year. It was a good year. Yeah, it was, uh, it was all right. Um, so uh, in conclusion, we're uh, 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 we're uh, an extra set of hands, as we tell people, uh, that if a cluster needs some support, we'll uh, see if we can give support uh, when we're able to do so. Okay, uh, Athlete, can, uh, should we proceed with the Eduardo session? I, I can see somebody to my left sort of twitching oh. to say something, so I'm going to hand over to Bruno for a moment, if that's okay, Frank. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's great. Uh, Frank, th thanks, thanks a lot for the update. Um, yeah. And maybe just give also a little bit of background. Uh, Frank, you, you elaborated quite extensively indeed on, on, uh, on, on the work that the LET partners are doing on updating the RCAs. And I think we cannot stress enough that 
the value of the LCA, the updated value of the LCA, uh, uh, is, is, is largely uh, uh, done by, by the LET partners as well, and which is still making that the LCAs, the logistics capacity assessments, uh, still uh, touch around, and I forgot the exact number, so I think it's something around 700,000 clicks a year or something across all the pages. So it remains one of the, the top products on that one. Uh, and we very often, and, and Frank, maybe just because we, 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 need, we need to talk a little bit longer before we go to the next session, because people are going to dial in, of course, also for Eduardo. Uh, Frank and, and, and Alice, maybe also a little bit of a, a Q&A on that one, on what, according to you, uh, would make that the LET is one of the longest lasting, and in uh, wow. the opinion of some, uh, some of the more uh, successful partnerships. Would you have any opinion on that? Uh, sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'll answer the LCA, uh, uh, talk a little bit about LCAs, um, and then we can talk about uh, the partnership. So, uh, Bruno, you're right, LCAs are very, very important. Um, a, a lot of the work that, as everyone knows, in supply chain, that supply chain professionals do is not necessarily related to, uh, to assets. We manage assets, but um, a lot of companies and a lot of humanitarian organizations and logisticians don't own or lease or otherwise control the assets. We simply manage them. And that speaks to the importance of information in supply chain context. Most of the stuff that we do is related to information. And LCAs are an example of providing market, uh, current market information, or at least information that you know, is, is important and relative to the market. Um, on, on, a, on an ongoing basis that might not necessarily expire. Um, getting that updated and, and providing it and getting the latest information you have from people who are working in those markets um, and earning their living in those markets, they have a lot, a lot of information to offer. We had a very good example of this a, a couple of years ago where one of the agility uh, uh, subsidiaries called TriStar Liquid Logistics, they do fuel and energy transport. Um, they had operations, you know, they, they were familiar with Somalia. They had, you know, they've been working there for a while and, you know, we needed some information on Somalia and they gave us really, really good information on Somalia. It wasn't a lot of drama. They just went out and cranked it, cranked, cranked it up and, 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 and got it done. And uh, it, you know, it's an, an, an immediate contribution to humanitarians that are working in and around Somalia to help, help to get that, to, to help them plan, do, do their planning and, uh, and execution. Um, so the, the information is valuable, you know, having it at, at one's fingertips is very, very good. In fact, I suspect that a lot of those hits are, are you know, some of those hits come from people in the, in the commercial sector who actually understand that the cluster tracks all this information. And if you're actually trying to move stuff around in a place like Central Africa Republic, on a commercial basis, like getting that information is really, really hard. So it's, it's, it's a significant amount of value in those LCAs. Um, so that's uh, my two cents on that. Alice, any thoughts on LCAs? Um, no, I mean, that, that's it. We, our employees love the fact that they get to help provide this information too. So when you go and ask one of our logisticians to contribute to an LCA, um, they get excited. They want to use their expertise to help the humanitarian organizations. So um, it, it, it gives our uh, private sector employees an, an opportunity to jump in and assist humanitarian organizations. So it's a, it's a win for you guys, but it's also a win for us because yeah. it uh, provides that um, enjoyment for our employees. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for that. And, and actually, we have somebody also online who is excited, uh, an excited partner. Uh, Marie, thanks a lot for being with us. Uh, you had a question, Marie. Hi, Bruno. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Frank and Alice, for the presentation. Very, very interesting to get some background on how things work, because this is definitely tools which are very useful for partners. I'm working for uh, Solidarité with uh, an internal NGO. Um, and I wanted to get back on uh, maybe a couple of things, because um, I'm part of the persons who are sometimes Quite in difficulty to understand these private uh, part, private uh, sector partnerships and how we can benefit as humanitarian uh, better on uh, this this thing. And I wanted to 
to check with you because we will we as partners rely a lot on the lock cluster and um, to get information and so on. And I was wondering whether as uh, the LET, you were eager to get some uh, kind of information from us. How can we better collaborate and not only rely on a like a vertical from you to us, but rather with a feedback system where uh, getting on your point of view on uh, the LCA or some other tools, there would be better information needed from partners on the field to get things uh, better. Yes, um, uh, short answer on that is, yes, we're always interested in, in hearing feedback. Uh, we have um, monthly meetings with the, the, lock, uh, the steering committee for the LET, we meet monthly. The logistics cluster <coughs> meets with us at least quarterly during those meetings. And we have two semi, we have two meetings per year directly with the cluster just to, to address these, the, the kind of issues you just described as well as other issues. One of the things that we're doing this year um, is we're working with, uh, with the cluster to do the logistics operational guide update. Um, and that's based on, that's giving us an opportunity to provide information into the log that can be used by all humanitarians. Um, but it's also an opportunity to get feedback to say, okay, you know, what, what, what content needs to be in the log? And, you know, then we can respond to that and, and provide that in there. This, it's very, one of the unique attributes of our partnership, Marie, is um, we only, uh, we, 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 we can offer services to the cluster, but generally speaking, we, we only provide services that the cluster requests. So it's not a push, it's more of a pull. So we don't, we're not, we're not going to come in and say, this is what you, this, these are the services you need to take from us, nor are we going to come in and say, this is how the humanitarians need to do, uh, do their work. Um, you know, we need to um, make sure that we understand because we're very different from humanitarian organizations, very, very different. So it's very much uh, based on, um, Hey, what do you guys need and how can we offer support? Uh, because we don't, we don't have all the answers all, all the time. And we, you know, we, don't, we certainly don't wanna make assumptions about what humanitarians really, really require. Um, and that kind of speaks to Bruno's question about you know, how, do, how is it that this partnership has been in existence for 15 years? And I think a lot of it is just based on kind of openness and transparency and uh, having a, an effective collaborative relationship with the cluster that enables us to get feedback from humanitarians to say, this is what we need. And uh, as a teaser, Eduardo, we think is one of those things. Uh, we, uh, we, that's, uh, we think that this might be a tool that humanitarians might like. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't like it, you can blame David. No, just kidding. Uh. <laughs> I, won't, I won't blame David before seeing Eduardo, but uh, thanks for the comments. And definitely um, one of, for me, for, um, of the strengths of the partnership is that it is not business related. There is nothing which is like, um, you're not selling anything. Uh -huh. Sometimes as an INGO, we're in a position where we need the data, we need information, but we are always uh, feeling we are somehow uh, manipulated to get, yeah. because the business is made in a way where the the, part, the um, threat for water, for example, is aimed to, to sell you something which they're usually doing. They're not trying to get what we need and how we work and how specific is the humanitarian business, specifically in a context where there has not been operation for a while. And yeah. so uh, we need to streamline this. And this is definitely something uh, the LET uh, together with the LCA preparation and the lab cluster is helping us. So thank you very much for uh, this fruitful yeah. uh, partnership. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, absolutely. In fact, I think Alison might want to comment on this, you know, how, how we actually set, you know, separate and firewall what you to, to make sure that we're not out there, you know, selling used cars, so to speak. Alice, uh, any uh, add to that? Yeah, I mean, when we, every time we meet as a group together, we talk about um, the firewall. But I mean, the, the partnership is us working together for, to support the logistics cluster. It is part of all of our CSR corporate responsibility. And uh, we just learned, you know, that it's best and we can accomplish so much more and help so many more people by doing it together. And when we work together and we have all of our assets and all of our logisticians working together, um, you know, there is no fight for, we're all working for the logistics cluster. I'm not working for UPS, Frank's not working for agility. Uh, and so that alone 
ensures that uh, we're not selling you anything. We're all one team. Uh, we each have our own things that we sell, our company sells on the end, but we work as a team and we work for the logistics cluster or the WFP when we are operating or working to provide the information. Correct. We have a, it, like when we set the, when we set up the partnership, and this is actually good for, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of the organizations on this call may be thinking about bilateral partnerships or multilateral partnerships with other, you know, it could be food providers, it could be medicine providers, it could be, you know, other supply chain partners, wh whatever they might be. One of the things that I think was successful has been hugely impactful, a, a really big enabler um, for the LET is our ground rules. We, we, we wrote a ground rules document um, like 15 years ago. In 2006, we wrote it. And essentially what we did is we had a workshop with the cluster and the LET partners. And we said, okay, what are the issues, you know, what are the things that would, would help us be successful? What are the things that could actually prevent it from being successful? And we came up with a list of these issues. And one of them was this firewall, you know, firewall commercial from pro bono activities. Another one was, you know, taking cues from, from governments that, you know, we take our, as, as the LET, we take our cues from, from the cluster when we're in the field and operations. And, you know, we, we do what the cluster says and the cluster manages and that's how you know you address things like civil military cooperation and things of that nature. But the, the, there are some complexities between private sector and public sector. But that uh, ground rules document has been such a uh, it's such a valuable tool for our partnership um, because it defines the ethical parameters of our partnerships. It provides us some guidelines and 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 say, okay, these are the things how we should do. This is how we should manage communications. This is how we should uh, manage. You know, if, if we're providing services in a geography where one or more of the companies has, a, has existing commercial relationships, including with humanitarians. So how do we manage that? Th that document pro provides a ground rule for that. And it's provided kind of a, a, a compass star for us as we've navigated the partnership over the years. So, uh, you know, it, I would encourage the, the people on this call, if you're looking at public-private partnerships on your own, bilateral partnerships, that you engage in those discussions. And the, another thing that we did in the beginning was um, we did a lot of, spent a lot of time engaging and testing and designing and talking. And just that talking, it took us like a year and a half. And it was, it was really slow. We liked to, everyone likes to go fast. So it was kind of like, can't we just get on with it? But no, we, we, uh, we um, it was, it's proved very, very valuable because then you get to know your partners, you get to know each other. And, uh, you build trust and then you say, okay, actually, I can, we can work with these, you know, they, they can work with us, we can work with them. So it was, it was a good outcome. Thanks, Frank. And, and maybe just adding a, 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 another side, another perspective to this as well. Over the last six to eight months, uh, we've done quite a lot of interviews, both with colleagues from the private sector as from with humanitarian uh, colleagues on what um, on, on, on how we can best nurture and foster public-private partnerships, uh, and then especially as a logistics cluster, because we, we are, of course, and, and, and many of us in the humanitarian sector, and I think COVID-19 has only reconfirmed that, uh, everybody's getting quite a lot of uh, indications of interest for cooperation in public-private uh, partnership uh, and, and CSR, uh, whether you like the abbreviation or not. As such, and, and uh, we, we were really trying to, to, to identify what are the added values uh, from the different setups. Uh, and then, of course, as a cluster, we were looking at what is the added value of a cluster, which is bringing together that community of partners, 534 at the moment, so that the impact of that cooperation is as broad as possible. And so that also that you have that single point of contact for a number of organizations, which is then having that reach to a multitude of, of organizations. And I think this is also where the LET uh, uh, has, has been one of the shining examples uh, on that one. When there is a request coming uh, to or going out to the LET, it is not on behalf of one entity, it's not on behalf of one or, uh, organization, it is on behalf of a critical mass of humanitarian actors uh, who are seeing an upcoming or existing uh, humanitarian challenge in a, in a country. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, instead of having 25 uh, requests from 25 different organizations, it, comes to, it, it is streamlined through one channel of communication, which is then also making it easier, uh, uh, both for, for the people on this call from the LET, uh, but also from, from the, for the humanitarian partners and knowing uh, what, what it's going to stand for. And then it comes back to that point of predictability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just to, to, to recap, uh, some, there's uh, a greater interest in public-private partnerships, and how can you know how how can these things be built and, and baked more into the cluster? Is that kind of what we're the the question you're asking, uh, Bruno? Uh, nope, sorry, Frank, no question. It was more of a statement. So uh, okay, I just wanted to say that, uh, it was more, more of a statement that we did that research over the last few months yeah. and, and trying to see, I mean, what is the added value for the logistics, for the humanitarian community, for the logistics cluster to engage in public private partnerships oh, yeah. on behalf of, of the wider humanitarian community? Yeah. Uh, and actually, you were interviewed as well, Frank. Uh, you might remember. Uh, we, we were looking for your views on that one as well. So. Um, but if I would say if there's no qu further questions on that, or maybe we give it another moment, and then uh, Frank, it's all yours to go to. I, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Something with an Eduardo. Okay, all right. I would say, uh, Bruno, in, res in, in response to that, I think you're right. The cluster. One of the reasons why the LET is partnering with the with the cluster um, is because it, it is impactful. It has broad reach. Um, <clears throat> they say if you want to go if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. So what we, you know, we, we started this partnership years ago and it's turned into a very, very good thing for all of the companies. Uh, we hope that we're, at, we're adding value to the humanitarian community and to the cluster. Um, and we hope we can continue to do so uh, long into the future. Um, so, uh, all right, with that, uh, shall, we, uh, shall we go uh, onward? Well, we do have a um, question in the chat about how can one volunteer for the LET or other humanitarian or logistics organizations um, to add more hum uh, human resource to support the operations. Um, and that's from Benjamin. And Benjamin, the LET is a partnership with the organizations that you see on the um, ground. So you have to be part of UPS, Agility, DP World, our merch to volunteer with the LET. Although I know Bruno can probably talk about ways you can get involved with volunteering with logistics cluster. Um, our particular partnerships use our employees um, and we match the exact need with the employee that has that specific expertise. Um, but Bruno, do you want to talk about um, volunteering with the logistics cluster? Uh, am I not doing that every day, Alice? I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, please feel free to reach out. Of course, there's a difference between an individual uh, wanting to volunteer and then uh, we, we're going to guide you. Uh, or of course, uh, we, we have a number of communication channels and a number of partnerships also with private sector stakeholders uh, outside of the LET. Uh, and, and happy, uh, Benjamin, uh, if you can reach out to that on that and, and we can have a chat on that one. I see Maximilian, you had a question. Uh, nope, not yet publicly available. It's uh, too, too, too fresh, too new. It's, uh, we, we need to get the typos out of it first. We share it as soon as possible. <laughs> 